one. Good day and welcome everybody. We're glad that you joined us for this securityboulevard.com webinar. My name is Mitch Ashley. I'll serve as your host, moderator, and participant in our discussion today. Uh, today's topic is the future of cybersecurity education, exploring the 2021 Cloud Security Report. Today's webinar is sponsored by ISC Squared. Of course, I'm sure you know the or that organization, one of the leading cybersecurity professional organizations in our industry. Uh, you probably most know them from the CISSP, which was the first certification I remember came out when I was getting started in security. And now they have a range of different certifications for certified cloud, security professional, software, uh, secure software lifecycle professional, et cetera. So be sure to check out certifications on the isc2.org website. So a few housekeeping items before we kind of get into our topic here. We are recording today's webinar and all participants will receive an email with a link to the recording as well as a copy of the, these slides. So you'll be able to participate. We're really gonna be presenting a combination of data to you as well as uh, some commentary by today's panel who will introduce in just a moment. We're also giving away for a Amazon gift cards at the end of the webinar. So please stick around and find out if you're one of our winners for a gift card. And we do, we really love questions. Um, today, today's webinar style is a mix of both data presentation and conversation. And that conversation is always best if you're involved in it. So we'd love to have your comments in chat, uh, questions in the Q&A section. Matter of fact, if we take just a moment to look at the web interface for our webinar software, Big Marker. You'll notice there's a chat tab, just type things into the public. Hello, I'm this, hey, what about this? And converse, conversing with um, both uh, the speaker or panelists as well as other audience members. And if you have a question, just pop it into the Q&A tab. So sometimes that chat can really get going and get some good healthy conversation going that can also drive our conversation. So don't underestimate the power that you have of helping drive our content for today. So let's move on to our topic of the day, future of cybersecurity education and exploring the 2021 cloud security report. This is what the cover of the report looks like. You can get that at the isc2.org site and download your free copy of that. So I do want to introduce our panel. we go back just a moment here that are participating with us today. And I'll ask them to do a brief uh, introduction of themselves. First is Jennifer Manella. I've known Jennifer for quite a while working in security. Uh, so Jennifer, uh, who is founder and principal advisor at her company, Vision Security. Would you introduce yourself, Jennifer? Sure, Mitch. Hi, everybody. It's JJ, um, JJX on Twitter. Um, so yeah, I'm a network security architect turned a um, little bit more of a security architect and advisor in my new company here. Um, I've had a long history, of course, with education and ISC squared specifically um, throughout the past you know, 10 or 15 years. Um, so this is a great conversation. Happy to be here with Rob again, too. Excellent. Thanks for joining us. And as you mentioned, Rob Lee. Um, Rob is a chief curriculum director and faculty lead with the Sands Institute. So he's been in the industry a while too. I'm not going to tell, ask him to say how long, but uh, <laughs> Rob, if you can introduce yourself. Hi, thanks, Mish and uh, Jennifer. So I've been in the cybersecurity industry for, I will go and say it, uh, over 20 years. Uh, former Air Force, uh, did a bunch of stuff in the government, worked at Mandiant, uh, primary forte at that point was uh, digital forensic sense and response and uh, really have uh, worked in education on digital forensics and incident response training over probably uh, 8,000 individuals across the industry at this point. Uh, you know, a lot of you I may have trained uh, uh, out there doing uh, that kind of work in the cybersecurity industry. Uh, currently, I'm um, helping uh, head up the curriculum here at the SANS Institute, but one of the things that I really like doing is connecting with CISOs, uh, talking about education, workforce management, and trying to you know fill the gaps that most people are struggling with right now, and how to retain and manage the, the complex uh, threats that are uh, you know hampering our industry, uh, especially right now. But uh, really happy to be here, and uh, I appreciate the invite again. Uh, excited to have you, and uh, 
you have a wealth of experience and train many, many people and as well as your expertise in, in cybersecurity. So glad to have you both with us today. So as I mentioned, uh, you can get the report from the SANS, or SANS you can get the report from the isc2.org uh, site, and that's free to download. I went, we're going to use this report as kind of a guide for our discussion today. Just a little bit of background on the report. Um, you know, had a healthy um, response for the report. It's focused really on really understanding you know, as cloud becomes a bigger, bigger, and is the big part of our, our world today, and increasingly so, you know, we're looking for trends and challenges. You know, how are organizations responding to security threats? And what, what are we changing? Or how are we meeting the, the challenge with the tools and best practices that organizations are involved in? I mentioned a healthy response. had 783 uh, people responded. And that's the, during 2021, and that's across a mix of technical executives, security practitioners, uh, a good a good mix of representation. So we're not just talking just technical people or just management, uh, but a healthy mix of both. So let's turn our sights to uh, some of the data that is in in the in the report itself. And I think one of the early early content of the report talks about how concerned are you about the security of public clouds. And I can remember getting into cloud, right, in the late 2000s, early 2010s. That was always the big issue. Well, we could go to the cloud, but we're concerned about the security of it. Well, of course, we're still concerned about the security um, within operate, uh, environments that we're operating in. Um, the data showed uh, extremely concerned, very concerned, uh, 32% and 41%. So a large part of the populations are concerned about security in the public cloud. And while we've been operating in that environment, I'm curious, JJ, um, if you have any perspective of, is it less a fear of going to the cloud or once, we end, once we're in using the cloud, making sure we really truly understand the environments that we're operating in? Well, I think it's all of the above. Um, you know, if you if we roll back from that a second and we look at, you know, going through audits and assessments and pen tests just with our normal on prem environment, we still don't always get that right. Um, and, it, and it's hard to, you know, it, it's hard to kind of wrap our, our heads and minds around all of that and the, the pieces, parts that move to make it completely well, not completely secure, but as secure as it can be without, you know, this constant fear. And so, you know, these are technologies and products we've had in place for 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 years. Um, and now we have something that's moving at the speed of light. Um, and we don't necessarily have, you know, the, the people who know how to move the things that were here up into that environment and then um, and then secure it and monitor it properly. So that's that's pretty prevalent across across all, all of you know the organizations that I work with um, and their teams. And it's it's becoming more common for people, you know, to have those resources in house. Um, it's been more of, you know, kind of hiring in specialists or consultants, at least through a, a part of that migration um, and, and a little bit of ongoing care and feeding to get the right resources. You know, one thing is too, um, also Rob, looking at the, the next question that's part of the survey, you know, what are your biggest, um, uh, how, 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 can, how confident are you in your organization's security posture? Now, the largest percentage were moderate, but um, you were still talking about 28. Only 28% um, were feeling in that barrier or extremely confident. Now, if we're Ted Lasso, speaking of, <laughs> um, you know, a recent Emmy Award winning show, if you follow that show, you know, you're not going to feel very comfortable fielding a team that's 20%. 28% extremely confident, sort of a lot of folks in the middle of it. You might have to do that. Um, so I'm not trying to, to downplay, you know, our confidence level in, in the teams that we have or in our organization's security posture, but that says there's a lot of work to do. Oh, yeah. No, I, I, I'm just, I'm laughing. I, I got to point out, who's the 1% on the previous slide that said, hey, I'm good. 
There's, there's no budget. I mean, one percent. That's at least seventy people said no. We're good. We we got security. We got security now. We got this. We got. Yeah, this. we got this. And then, but it's a higher number that they're extremely confident here on the uh, that their posture is okay. Um, <laughs> there's the, always the, one. <laughs> the, the interesting thing here is about you know COVID and what happened with moving a lot of organizations over to the virtual workforce has driven a lot of you know, organizations migration rapidly, as Jennifer was saying. Uh, previously into the software as a service mindset. I mean, even using Zoom as a platform, you know, single sign on, how do you manage that? You know, it tie into the Microsoft domain, tie into, you know, Office 365 uh, shares and file shares. All of this stuff is no longer on prem. It's all in the cloud. All, you know, entire organizations transformed in less than nine months. And you know, when you ask them, how, do you, how confident are you? Of course, everyone's like, I don't even know how it all works, much less how I'm on trying to secure this stuff. And we're relying and overly relying on a lot of these large scale enterprises to manage it. And they are trying to come out with features, as Jim was saying, the light speed feeling of this that's actually occurring is because you have a highly competitive um, uh, service industry that is trying to serve, you know, hey, we need this as a part of our backend capability for Salesforce tied to Zoom, tied to, uh, tied to our file shares, tied to Outlook, just so our workforce can manage everything correctly and all be able to interact in a virtual workspace. This is freaking hard. And then you're asking people, hey, are, do you feel secure in here? And everyone is a little bit shaky on this. Of course, that's going to happen. It's just right now, I, if there's an organization out there that is not in the cloud, it would shock me just because of what happened over the past uh, 18 months and, and uh, the virtual workforce as it relate to COVID. And I'm going to jump in because I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm multitasking here and reading all kinds of stuff. And I see Steve. Yes, I'm extreme. <laughs> I think Rob and Mitch and I are all, yes, the extremely confident 6%. But there's also, I mean, I'm kind of like trying to reframe some of these questions and, and understand the context that they were asked and how they were answered. So the last slide, I think, said, you know, how confident are you in, in the security of public clouds, not necessarily in the security of the organization's use of the public clouds. Um, and then this screen, this this slide, I think, gets more into your organization's uh, cloud security posture. But Rob, I mean, you just hit on something. You know, I think a lot of times we kind of Think about it as, you know, if we're, we're doing the lift and shift thing, right, moving a data center somewhere. But there's all of these other things with Zoom, the recent thing with um, a, an email contact platform, which was the pathway to um, a, a, reach, a recent um, breach there. So it's just all of these other things. And of course, you could go down a whole other webinar and rabbit hole of the visibility of these these different platforms that organizations are using. Um, but it's it's hard, if nothing else, to even know that you know what is being used and, and what data is accessible where in these various SaaS platforms. Oh yeah, and you know, on top of that, you're saying they were asked a simple question, where's your data? And mm -hmm. You don't know. And then on top of that, if you're still dealing with GDPR and other very highly regulatory compliance related items, if something does happen, trying to answer that simple question within the time frame that you're supposed to is you know near impossible at this point. So, you know, I, I do agree. Even those who are very confident, I want to know who you are. Let's chat because I, I, I'd, like to, I'd like to understand that confidence just a little bit. They could train the rest of us, I think. Right. Well, possibly. <laughs> I mean, you know, that could be useful. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it, it's, it's really interesting data. I mean, not surprised to see a lot in the middle. But, um, you know, one of the things if we move on to the next question, I don't think we're going to see a lot of surprises. And, and the slides here, the, the data is really kind of compact into a little small area. I'll give everyone a summary of some of these slides. But what are your, your biggest uh, cloud security concerns? You're going to sound really familiar. Data loss and leakage, data privacy and confidentiality, accidental, accidental exposure of credentials, legal and regulatory compliance, all the way down the list. And really all the things, all those things, that's not new. We've we've been concerned about those things forever, right? As part of part of the security world that we're in. So is it that the is it that the concerns haven't changed or have certain things become more of a focus that we're we're in the cloud or maybe a mix of cloud and on-prem? You want to take a shot at that, JJ? Yeah, but I'm gonna answer the question. I'm gonna 
make a comment that's not answering your question. So I'll okay, well, then you're like everyone else on TV shows that does I'm, that. So you're in good company. Let me not answer your question. I just tell you up front, I'm not going to do that. Um, <laughs> when I look down this list, you know, so much of this is intertwined or related or, or overlapping right in that Venn diagram of data loss and leakage, which is similar to data privacy and confidentiality, which if you kind of look further down the list somewhere, there's a, there's a, there's a comment about fraud or theft of data in addition to, you know, exposure of credentials and then obviously liability related to all of that. And so, you know, these things are, are so intrinsically intertwined and they, you know, I think later in, in the report, when I read it through, there's some comments about misconfigurations and stuff. So, you know, there's, there's definitely a lot of opportunity, I think, for us to educate and secure things and maybe kill several of these little bullets or birds with a, a few stones, maybe. I'll throw in there. Yeah, one, of the one of the ones I'm surprised, surprised. not seeing, I'm getting a little bit of feedback. Oh, it's gone now. Uh, that is not on this list is skilled workforce. And again, I just wanted to double check. I'm going down here. The it does thing that come we hear, I don't believe it's on this yeah. list. Yeah. One, one of the things that it, it, tied to security is, you know, you can't secure things you don't understand. You can't secure things that you don't have, a, you know, basic sysadmin like skills to be able to do that. And there's so many people out there that, are, you know, just take a look at not even the cybersecurity side of it. How do you manage the cloud management workforce in the IT space. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, how do we do the cybersecurity? These platforms are being updated so quickly that there's a almost unintentional opaqueness that is coming out of it. Because when you're trying to talk about, well, can I deploy monitoring? Can I deploy uh, disaster recovery and some response, uh, you know, data loss, um, you know, style tools in there, it sometimes becomes a challenge even how to, well, I don't even know how to, you know, do core things on some of these platforms because they just updated it. So it's this constant struggle for the workforce. And everyone's dealing with this right now, too, is like the I don't have enough people to uh, take on some of these problems as well. And that is like, you know, you, all these problems go away when you sit there and say, who is actually going to handle one of them? And we don't even have enough people to be in our workforce to be able to have the team you look at that is going to take these challenges on. Everyone is struggling with hiring. Everyone is stealing each other's, you know, person. If you people, if you have cloud in your background, it just it's just like everything else. You put cloud on a security book title, I guarantee it's selling right now. But if you have cloud experience in your uh, resume, that is going to be amazing. But just like you see HR coming out, it's just like, hey, we need we need, want someone with uh, eleven years Kubernetes experience. Uh, to help us out and i'm like wait a minute you know it's a, it's an online meme that's going around right now where kubernetes has not been around that long but hr is like such a struggle trying to find these people they're just put you know shooting uh paintballs at the wall trying to get anyone who's willing to come in uh with any type of background that's touching these technologies it is just it, it, it is hard that is the biggest thing i'm hearing people talk about constantly is just trying to get anyone who actually can tie their shoes uh, with any of these technologies. And then you get into AWS, GCP, and Azure, and all these other things, and it just heads explode. Well, we're gonna talk in a little bit about some of the ways of, of how we're educating, which is you know the one of the title topics of this conversation oh, yeah. too. You know, just my one comment I would add is I think if, if nothing else, one of the things we've all experienced now in the rapid move to the cloud and online services, SaaS services, et cetera, is, is you can't know any one application and feel like you still know it because it changes so rapidly out from underneath this pile that on top of all the business applications and software infrastructure and service providers, all of it's changing all of the time. So those, the, it, to me, that takes you back to the fundamentals. You've got to really invest in the fundamentals of security, imply that in so many different domains um, across our environments. Mitch, I wanted to kind of interrupt you for a second there mm -hmm. because I think, you know, you you just hit on something that, you know, Rob kind of mentioned about, you know, stuff on the back end changing and it being a little bit opaque. And that's that, you know, if I configure a traditional on-prem, you know, switch or router or firewall, you know, unless I manually run a patch update and then, you know, check the change logs and, and revalidate everything, I'm going to know if something changed the behavior of how it's working and, and with, the, with those off times where you write circumstances where there's a manufacturer bug. 
But with the cloud applications, they're just constantly, you know, they're in that DevOps cycle where they're continuously doing development. And a lot of the platforms we work with have releases, you know, weekly. Um, and, you know, even even the mature platforms like Microsoft, you know, when I get notices all the time because, you know, how they were exposing data, certain connections on the back end between different modules changed from, you know, this month to, to next month. And so in addition to this kind of having the foundational knowledge, there is there is this opportunity, I think, where we have to capitalize on the education of um, being specific in platforms. I mean, I'm a you guys know I'm a huge, huge believer in fundamentals, 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 right? Understand the layers, understand this. But to, I think to secure stuff in the cloud, you have you have to intimately be familiar and trained on that platform, whatever that platform is or those platforms are, not just here's cloud security. Well, take, I mean, you know, also just to throw in there, did the release a couple of weeks ago of the Oh My uh, from Secret Agent, it's just talking to Moses Frost, uh, who's one of our authors, uh, it's just, it's interesting because he said, everyone is trying to analyze how big of an issue this is right now. And it is extremely challenging because they're trying to figure out if this back end, uh, you know, capability is even present on all their platforms. You know, it's like, it, it does a vulnerability exist? Core questions, hard to answer. You have this vulnerable um, capability released and it goes public. Everyone has the initial, uh, you know, oh my God moment that is coming out and you can't even figure out, it's like, are we actually affected? And of course, you know, CISOs are saying, uh, do you know if we're affected? And everyone's running around trying to analyze the just core question. Do we even have this thing even inside our platforms? And, you know, a lot of organizations, you know, because of that release, couldn't even answer that core question. You know, go back to, you know, this slide specifically, hard to do. Um, and that's, you know, you know, a key example that's out there. And I asked Moses, is how, you know, how big of a threat was that? And he said, I honestly don't know at this point. And he's, you know, one of the experts in the cloud uh, trying to, you know, really analyze it. He said, every platform I thought I was, I owned, I thought it would be in there, wasn't there. So I initially thought it was a big issue. And then after about three days looking at it, I dropped it down to maybe an issue. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, is it not an issue? He said, well, and you get, that. <laughs> you get that, but this is just the beginning of these exploits. And, you know, uh, people are really starting to take a look at these services that are embedded in these clouds, trying to get any leverage point, you know, to be able to, you know, increase the attack surface and they're doing it. But then most organizations are running around and don't even know what the basic attack surface looks like, even if they're vulnerable. I think both excellent points. And uh, I, I guess it's not only the rapid changing, but also you don't the opaqueness of you don't see what's underneath all the stuff that your other providers, other clouds, other apps, et cetera, are utilizing themselves. So to, to make an assessment like you're talking about, Rob, can be nearly impossible. Maybe it is impossible. You know, because you don't you don't have access to all of that. Uh, let's talk about some of the the biggest operational challenges. First on the list was lack of qualified people, forty nine percent. Compliance was second at forty percent. Visibility into the infrastructure, security thirty six. Okay, now we're talking about all the things we've been identifying: misconfigurations, setting up policy, consistent policies, etc. You know, operating in a continuous and automated security controls. So we're in this dynamic DevOps, DevSecOps world. Top of that list is what we talked about earlier, the lack of qualified staff, um, either training, educating our current staff, um, also acquiring new staff. We're all competing for the same, the same pond of people, if you will. And how do we grow that pond, make it bigger? So what do we do other than just trading seats and hiring each other's people and uh, getting some more education? You know, what can we do to, to help ourselves more aggressively take on that challenge of lack of qualified people? Easy well, question, I'll, easy answer, I'll, I'm sure. I'm also gonna just point out a slight commentary here. I, I am gonna call out the not sure column down there at the end of only 2%. I actually think that should be all the way at the top. I just like, don't know what, <laughs> what are- I don't we, know what I don't know. We don't know. Um, it's, a, you know, the, the skilled workforce is going to be that, that this is a problem that's never going to go away, especially right now. Um, I am, you know, people ask me this all the time, but you look at it from a lens in, in particular of what are you willing to pay 
to get that workforce. And this is, again, a basic economic question and how large of a team do you need? I tell a lot of organizations out there the lack of being able to scope the problem correctly of what you're trying to accomplish is uh, the key problem and actually should be ahead of the workforce. But because of the way management deals with you know problems is either solve one of two ways. Number one, I'm going to buy a vendor tool and I'm just going to deploy that vendor tool because the vendor tool says it'll do all the things. The second thing is I'm just going to throw bodies at what I think the problem is without even properly scoping out what the, is that an actual problem in our organization. So you end up over hiring in some cases or under hiring in some cases because you've not properly done the problem scoping. And that's what the challenge here is, is in order to scope the problem, you don't have enough insight into the platforms that you're signing up for because IT is running around saying, hey, we have a requirement. We have to get email. We have to get these back end platforms. We have to get our web server deployed. And so they're rushing around and signing up for services you don't even know about. And the old joke in instant response world, when we were uh, doing its response at large, these large scale engagements, you're dealing with networks that have been there for 20 years that still have old school ISDN lines that were active on the network because the people that set that up left, you know, 10 years ago and you have the blinky light thing that's sitting there and everyone's afraid to unplug it because they don't know what's actually attached to. So it's been still sitting there. And that was a backdoor into the back uh, the back end network. The same thing's going on in the cloud. Everyone's rushing out, signing for services left and right, deploying platforms. And you're trying to scope this out and saying, well, what is our chief concern? What is our problem? Well, I don't know. Let's just hire people until we find, we're, we're going to throw people at unknown problems until we are sure we're confident that we're doing something good. And this is a horrible mistake scope the problem, really get your, you know, your head around this. And that's where I think that not sure column should be at the top because it shows that people truly are not focusing in on, if you're just saying it's a skilled workforce issue, you're not focusing on what is the actual scoping of the problem that you're trying to do. Well, and, and I'm sorry, I'm over here giggling, but I mean, I, I agree with you, but maybe that's the thing is they don't, they don't know what they don't know, right? Yeah. If they don't, if this, if, if this is new to them, I'm dealing with the same thing right now with several clients and CISOs, right? They they don't have a CISO. They don't have really a security operations team. They don't have any cyber risk management frameworks. They don't even know that they need those things. Maybe kind of conceptually, they understand that there's there's a better way to do it. But it, I think it's the same thing here that a lot of organizations and, you know, if you look at the demographics of this report, a lot of the responses were across, you know, all the way from fortune rated companies down, you know, down to, to through mid market and small. Mm -hmm. I think, I think there's a lot, I'm guessing based on these answers, because obviously, I mean, just the volume of answers of, of different answers here tells me like we collectively don't really know what we're doing. We don't know. Right. So <laughs> I don't know that we can scope. How do we scope? We don't know that we don't know. So I think that's, that's the, we need some, maybe sometimes, and how do you define qualified staff? Maybe that's, they need some help. Scoping well, we do know problem. we need people. Yeah, we do know yeah. we need people. We don't have enough of them. But again, you know, that's where, you know, how do you apply those individuals? Um, you know, again, yeah. one of the biggest challenges in cybersecurity in general right now is, you know, a lot of people answering these questions, and, you know, I have to call it out a little bit, is a lot of CISOs are in CISO positions that they should not be CISOs. Right. You know, let's call it out, you know, finally, and really start to address this. You need CISOs who are trained and understand what they're actually managing. Now, CISOs who know this are good. CISOs mm -hmm. who don't know this are like, yeah, uh, I bake it until you can make it type mindset. This is horrible. Don't put people in that critical role as an honorarium. It's just, what, well, we need a CISO. Hey, Bob, you went to Harvard. You're smart. You're in the role. No, you, we, at this point, you need someone who's able to unbox the technologies and saying, all right, let me help out. Let's look at cloud. Let's look at each one of these different areas and see how the organization is deployed and where they want to get to. They need to work with the CIO, the CTO across the board and trying to leverage, you know, how are we going to be approaching this organizationally? The only one who could do that is someone who's trained in it. It's like putting someone in cybersecurity like myself in a CFO role. Yeah, that would be brilliant, right? No, do not put me in charge of spreadsheets and financials. That would be a dumb, dumb idea. You, you just don't do this. Cybersecurity professionals need to be in CISO roles. Let's finally put that out and talk about it. I think that's one of the challenges, and we've talked about this on some other programs that we've been on, is 
Yes. You, know, you don't want to put someone qualified into that, that extremely important role. Also, you don't want to put someone who is highly technical, but can never talk to the business, right? Exactly. Never, never connect, make the connection to here's how we're satisfying these business goals, et cetera. I'm, I'm going to just touch on a few more of these. And then I want to, I want to jump into kind of some of the, some of the things that we can or can't rely on to help us with this. Um, so what are the biggest barriers uh, that we talk about for getting to the cloud? We talked about resources, data security, a lot, some of the same issues, uh, legal regulatory compliance, integration with IT environments, security risks, fear of vendor lock, kind of things that we've seen before, not, not new there. Um, and then, and then we get to um, sort of what do you see as the biggest uh, security threats in the public cloud misconfiguration, which actually turns out to be one of the highest uh, incidents in addition to your kind of social injuring, phishing, that kind of thing. Misconfiguration is a very frequent one. Um, talking about uh, unauthorized access, of course, that's how we can we break into into these networks. Um, you know, insecure interface. I think there's a lot of things that that are listed in this space, like sharing of data, hijacking accounts, malicious insiders, all those things are really going back to sort of those fundamentals of, you know, securing access, identity of users, uh, some of the, the core components of security that we have to now apply to environments that we don't directly control ourselves. It's some of those same security fundamentals. All right, so let's move on to, um, I'm really curious your reaction to this one. Um, how well do traditional security tools and appliances work in a cloud environment? 63% said they were, had, had limited functionality in the cloud environment. 18% um, all capabilities work in the cloud. So kind of the same applies to cloud, non-cloud. And 16% our traditional network security tools don't work in the cloud. So a large percentage in this kind of some, but not all of what we need within the cloud, which goes to what do you do? Is it a lack of what you've had? Is it a lack of the capabilities in the cloud that you need? Are you need to push on your cloud vendors, cloud, cloud based technologies to give you those capabilities? Do you have to look for something in the middle? How do we start to fill in this? Well, first of all, do you agree with that limited functionality? Six, three percent. JJ, maybe this is a good one for you to start with. And then what are some strategies around that? I think this is another, it depends. I think that's probably my, mo my most popular answer. Somebody should start paying me like a penny every time I say it, because I'd be a millionaire. Um, because again, it depends on what, what do we mean by network security tools? Because if we mean the security tools we use to monitor our LAN networks, then yeah, they don't <laughs> They're not, they're not designed to work in the cloud. But or if we kind the end line, probably not. Yeah, let's, <laughs> let's, let's expand that a little bit and talk about like just the, the rest of everything else, because this could also mean, you know, endpoint security and monitoring applications and, and things like that. And so, you know, I think the, the whole, you know, the, the complication of the past 18 months where everybody's kind of working from home or working from anywhere, um, this kind of came to light, which is our traditional tools for the visibility which I think we've all kind of agreed to, you know, is is kind of the starting line for securing something um, that that visibility in a large part is lost um, when endpoints get get taken away from the networks that we use to protect them and, and to monitor them and get that visibility. And so, um, you know, depending on the organization and the structure and how, how things are, are connected, um, you know, those things might be able to be able to, to phone home in, in, in some way through like stuff in a DMZ and, and get some visibility while they're moving around. But, you know, obviously there's some limitations to that. And I think this is kind of speaks to the trend of, you know, solutions that are around zero trust or maybe specifically like SASE and newer CASB integrations um, where we're going to get some better visibility control over the endpoint, the data paths, the security, the authentication, the encryption, um, as those things are, are moving, as the endpoints and the users are moving around and as the resources that they're connecting to are more, you know, cloud centric instead of on-prem. 
So I, I think these these numbers make sense to me, frankly. Um, I'm interested that is it 20, 20 almost 20 percent um, say that they have all of the same capabilities in the cloud as they as they do in traditional. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of curious. Yeah, I'd be curious what what that looks like for them, because, that you know, I do work with some organizations I have. Um, uh, one particular friend I talked to a lot that's a CISO in an organization, they have no on-prem presence. They are 100% in the cloud. Um, and, you know, that those, but those organizations I think are a little more rare. So I, I, I think these are, I think these are reasonable. What about you, Rob? I think the beginning of your question had me relook at the, well, your first assessment about the question itself. What do you mean by that traditional network security tools? I, I immediately rephrase the question in my in my head because what they're doing is you're applying a technology against a strategy. What is how well does your traditional network security strategy work in cloud environments? I feel that that's probably what people are struggling with. You know, we look at antivirus. Well, we had endpoint protection, and that was feeding into a sim, and then we we're able to do our SOC based monitoring. So the traditional SOC approach, for example, how do we do that? With everything now dispersed, we had on-prem, and of course, everything during the you know shutdown, everyone's you know had this massive transition, and then they were saying, well, how do we do? We're sending laptops to employees with all this endpoint protection on it, and we're hoping that that's going to feed back into the engine with all these cloud. You know, you can start to see where this starts to become more complex. That's where I think they're struggling with that, is that they're trying to figure out, hey, we're used to have everything like the you know the island of Australia. We could clearly define it. Everything outside of the island is a potential threat. Everything that's in, inside the island on-prem, we can manage, monitor, both network and point, hunting, uh, antivirus, everything's managed. Now, again, it's dispersed. And we have you know, things in space. We have things across the ocean. We have You can start to see how this starts to work. And then we start getting in the supply chain. Who are we connected to? Who are we working with? And now this thing is just blown up. Um, so I could see why this is a struggle because the question is how much visibility do you have? And that's what security is supposed to provide you is that's why we have the entire SOC. What, how much visibility do you have? And when you define it like that, then you start to realize, well, there's certain aspects where it's traditional visibility. We could deploy endpoints. We have that antivirus footprint. We could monitor the network footprint. But when we get into the extended side of that, do we have visibility in some of our uh, you know, cloud-based deployments? The answer is no. And so there's like, we have things that are out there we can't watch. And as a result, our traditional stuff and strategy has not worked. And that's where I think a, a lot of folks are kind of panicking, you know, going back to earlier questions. We don't know how secure we are because of this issue right here. That, that feeling that it's like, I cannot deploy my traditional um, SOC based approach like we've been doing for 10 years, especially over the past two. It may, it may, you know, Jennifer, your answer about all depends applies here, of course. Um, it, it may also represent that, you know, we're not early at the beginning of cloud adoption, right? We're somewhere past that early phase and into the right. kind of mid-cycle of it. So the lift and shift, while you may, you may still be doing that, but that's often where people get started. Many people have done that. You can take your VMware with you. You can take your... Um, Palo Alto with you, you know, kind of into the software appliance world and largely manage things, operate things pretty similar to my, how you might have done things on premise. Now comes multi cloud. Now comes using services in AWS and Azure and Google Cloud that are part of that and building apps that use that. Now comes Kubernetes and containers and container orchestration and microservices, new kinds of software architectures. That I think where what you're talking about, Rob, opens things up into, okay, now I need to know a lot more about application security than I used to, right? It's oh, yeah. network devices, uh, hardware appliances, and, and protocols that I know so well from you know ten years ago. So and maybe this is opening that up to that it's broadening so fast. We have so much more to to come up to speed on to be able to see to monitor, even inventory what we have in that environment. All right. This, the, the next, uh, this is really one thing fascinating things to me about 
this survey was, or this report, the next couple of questions I want to touch on and then have you comment on, you know, what overall benefits have you already realized from deploying to the cloud, more flexibility and for capacity and scalability, increased agility, improved ability, um, availability and business continuity, moving off of CapEx onto the software variable OpEx, et cetera. The next question also talked about um, moving to the cloud, how, how do you handle security? Um, sorry, I'm, I'm shifting between here, looking at the wrong ones. So better scalability, uh, faster time deployment, cost savings, um, reducing effort around patches, et cetera. So aside from the patches kind of things, the mention of business agility, not just continuity, the, men yeah. the, the mention of more flexibility, uh, not just capacity and scalability, but we're ta we're venturing into business things, things that have been driving digital transformation projects, to to use the buzzword, you know, that everybody has adopted. Um, but the business has changed, and ex expect expectations of us have changed. Traditionally, security hasn't been the best connected into the business strategy. Rob, talking about strategy. You know, are we getting more plugged into what's happening with the business and the drivers, or at least the why of what we need to be doing so that we know we need more flexibility, more, more agility as a security organization as well as part of the business? Or are we just fortunate that things that we hold as important to security professionals also happen to align with what the business wants? Where, do we, where are we? Or how well aligned are we with the business? It's, it's getting better. I mean, there's a lot of folks out there that are seeing a lot of commonalities from, uh, you know, why DevOps became, you know, the latest, uh, you know, buzzword for many years now, you know, that concept of, you know, the code and operations at the same time moving forward. And now we're moving, I think cybersecurity is realizing there's a lot of, hey, conceptually, there's a lot of things to learn from what they went through and what security is currently going through. And a lot of folks out there, you know, you don't realize you're in the, in the middle of a massive uh, cultural change across the entire cybersecurity industry until you're almost at the end of it. And you look back on it, it's like, oh, yeah, I guess I don't watch traditional TV anymore. It is only streaming or it's only Netflix. And you realize you don't. Yeah, I wonder when that actually happened. That cultural shift is currently going on cybersecurity. And I think that mentality of a stable environment that you're trying to protect that's not updated frequently has shifted and transformed, you know, rapidly into that similar, you know, feature set and progression culturally that code development went through when it got integrated in DevOps. And the DevOps primary driver was business uh, because the business operations needed to keep up to date and maintain, maintain that eye contact, the business agility, as you're just saying, Mitch, to um, uh, the interest of you know where the organization needed to go to. Same thing is now occurring in cybersecurity in which they're trying to maintain a certain agility to ma match that. And that DevOps, you know, uh, you know, hey, we could learn from them. Uh, we could watch how they did that. That sec DevOps mindset is definitely starting to take hold much, much more than I've ever seen before. And that's where I keep on going over and talking to DevOps folks. It's like, how did you realize, you know, that this is what you're doing as DevOps, not just, hey, I'm a coder, you know, that you're you're doing this kind of stuff inside the organization. And now they actually hire, you know, entire teams, like we're DevOps. And it's, you know, it's interesting, boom. It's like, now there's an entire structure of the organization that is dedicated to this mindset. And that's mm -hmm. what I think culturally is going through in the cybersecurity world. Yeah, I, I can add Go to that ahead, through a, a different lens and just, you know, because you kind of spoke to the, the DevOps and, and Sec DevOps there. If, if you look at it just, you know, coming from um, traditional infrastructures, you know, the more flexibility and scalability. I mean, obviously that translates um, within, you know, apps, but just being able to. So if, if I take somebody with, uh, you know, 60 remote offices and we're going to transition something or add 10 offices to it just being able to set them up with a platform, something that's cloud-based managed, API driven. And I mean, you know, tr traditional, you know, switches, routers, firewalls, APs, all of the stuff you use on-prem. Um, and we push those configurations, you know, automated through APIs and scripting, uh, you know, we can do a lot more than we can do with traditional networking technology where we're, you know, manually configuring, 
you know, either through a web UI or, or uh, CLI on a, on a switch or an infrastructure device. Um, so I think this, this cloud shift translates and it kind of trickles down, I think, into all aspects of technology, um, including traditional networking and infrastructure, because, you know, that is one of the major shifts for us in that space as well. You know, we're not, well, a lot of us still are, but we're moving towards, <laughs> we're not using SNMP and SSH. I have some, um, you know, some customers and some products that don't even support SNMP anymore. Um, and so we're retraining people to how do you securely connect this to the cloud? How do you do that DTP? How do you secure the APIs when you're doing these scripts for these auto provisioning? Um, so, you know, I think it just is kind of prevalent. You leveraging cloud, I think, is just kind of prevalent across all of technology. And, you know, I know everybody rolls their eyes and fills out their bingo cards when we say digital transformation. And that's fine. You're welcome. You got your bingo square. But it is it is it is a thing, right? Like we're we're using technology now to move the business forward, and I feel like that's finally all aspects of the different groups in technology, whether it's you know coding and app development and security and traditional infrastructure, networking, server storage, compute, all of that now is buying into this a little bit, and we are speaking this language because we we have to. Interesting. Um, just kind of think about our time left here. It's some more things I'd like to get to. Um, moving to the cloud, one of the discussions is, you know, uh, how do you handle your change in security needs using more of the services that come from the cloud providers for security, as well as, you know, third party um, security providers. But also, you know, are, are we at a point how, how dependent are we on the then the security or the cloud provider for training in those in those capabilities? Are we moving to an era where, you know, we're not only going to use many more of those tools, sixty-two percent responded that way, but are we going to rely more heavily on the vendors themselves? Remember back in the vendor days where all the training came from the vendors, um, or, are, or do we still rely heavily on you know organizations like? Uh, ICS2, um, et cetera. Thoughts on that? <laughs> I have some, but Rob, you want to go first? <laughs> Rob has a biased answer, was, so you go first. I was going to let you go first. That's why I was like, a oh, pause. So have to, I have my, I have my uh, finger on the mute button, Rob. So. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I feel like, well, so I know earlier, you know, I said, I think because of those backend switches that are very proprietary to the, to the different platforms, I think that, you know, professionals need to have that platform level specific training, just like with everything else. Um, but I think the foundation of that is understanding the language, whether whether you're a network uh, architect or app dev or cloud uh, security engineer, whatever you're doing, I feel like you have to learn that common language and those concepts and they are changing, right? It's relatively new in the grand scheme of technology, like the, the innovation cycle is spinning up a little bit. I think we're, you know, we're getting to the point where Rob and I, and probably you, Mitch, we've, you know, we're kind of like, oh, kids get off my lawn because, oh, it's not something new. We've relabeled something we were doing 20 years ago or 10 years ago. And I think now there are parallels and correlations to the stuff we had before, but it really truly is inherently different and we have to learn new stuff. And so that, you know, that cycle, I think, of learning all the new stuff has to have some foundational knowledge um, that I'm I'm a big proponent of vendor neutral training and then layering something else on top of it. Because, you know, coming from the networking world, obviously, everybody has Cisco certifications. I, I have architected for Fortune 50 down, maybe Fortune 5 down uh, to small organizations. I've never in my life taken a Cisco class. But what I took was HPE back in the day had training that was IEEE standards based, vendor neutral, and then they taught what Cisco did on top of it and how to integrate everything, um, which was exceptionally useful and I've made it through you know my adult adult life like that. Um, so you have to you have to get that that foundational knowledge of what are the standards, what are the words, what are the concepts, and then figure out okay how does this provider or that provider do it right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. This is such an interesting question, and I sit there and, and 
one of the things that I pause on, and and again, this is just culturally, you know, I'll just I'll joke around. You, I don't know if you guys have seen this before. We we need to have a all have a beer at some point because this is one of those things I usually bring up in a beer conversation. Oh, what are we doing right after this? I know <laughs> exactly right. Yeah, the, the uh, uh, when you take a look at the IT and you know anyone technology based workforce, one of the things that's happened, and this is you know, I think the first time we've had this technology shift this massive to cause this mentality to potentially occur. People in technology never like to admit what they don't know. And as a result, you know, we have some, you know, we obviously have a lot of, you know, very skilled people that have been around for, you know, at least two decades doing these type of, this type of job. And we assume because they're technical, hey, they must know cloud. And yet all of those technical people that have been around for a long time and they're really smart and they're really capable and they're really outstanding, and, you know, I even see this, you know, in our instructor core, our author core and everyone else. And I look around the room. I said, how many of you really know what you're doing with cloud? <laughs> the silence in the room is deafening. And I was like, it's not because, you know, we actually have uh, people who are really skilled in the cloud. But the thing is, like, does every answer responder out there know how to respond to a cloud? The answer is no. And again, in the answer response world, if you're sitting there and admit what you don't know, it is like this badge that is going to damage you. And again, you know, do we have enough individuals that are willing to step up that have been around for years to say, I have no idea what I'm doing. That's an issue. And this is the first time, this is where I go back to the beer conversation. We're at our first point that we need to have a reskilling program for IT professionals. And that is shifting what you traditionally know into cloud. And that is getting everyone to admit, you need to go back to training. You need to go take a class on this stuff. You need to go to the platforms, the vendors, and take their training, learn how to operate it, learn. You're smart. We know that already, but you admit that you can't do this particular job well, but they're not willing to admit it. They all stand behind this. I am technology. I am amazing. I could do this because I'm smart, and they're not willing to admit what they don't know. Now, there's a few out there that do. It's like, hey, I'm constantly. I don't know a lot. I'm constantly in training. True. But there's a large aspect of that pride function that I'm an IT person, I'm an information security. I refuse to admit I really have no idea what I'm doing in this. And it's that, you know, you talk about the age old for years we've talking about, uh, talked about the, uh, you know, uh, uh, what uh, syndrome that everyone has that everyone thinks you know more than you imposter. do. Imposter, imposter syndrome. syndrome. Thank you, Jennifer, for saving me here. The imposter syndrome, and this is the opposite effect of that, which is you actually don't know. Imposter syndrome is you actually do know what you're doing. You're just afraid to throw it out there. This is the opposite of that. People assume we know what you're doing because you've already proven yourself. And they just said, oh, this is another piece of technology. You know this, right? Yeah. And then you're like, oh, crap. And you're walking out the door saying, I hope they don't actually ask me a question on this. That is different. This is you need to understand where you're weak. Double down on that weakness. Admit to your bosses, I need and my team needs and start hammering that out in terms of how you're going to be able to educate your workforce. It's a first reskilling that I think we're, that we need to really admit how many people out there don't know what they're doing in this, you know, I'm a very generic, you know, bubble here around cloud. That's yeah. my beer discussion. Wow. That was like, let's. I'm going to talk for a second to give Rob like a ten minutes to come back down off of that soapbox. <laughs> put, put the <laughs> oxygen back, back in the room there for. It's for Rob. true though, and, and Mitch really, you know, if we're talking about it, is that is so true. Now I'm I got over that a very long time ago, um, and and even sitting on the RSA program committee, there's times with my you know my peers on that where we have this you know giant spreadsheet and. You know, I have like TBD comments and I'll get on with my team and I'm like, I don't know what these words mean. Like, I don't know what this is an important topic in this speaker submission because I don't actually understand what these means word in this, what these words mean in this order together um, or what this word means, period. Like, what is this? Is this important? And that's great. It's great to, you know, learn and, and ask. But yeah, you have to be comfortable kind of just saying, you know, I didn't, I like, I don't, I'm not cloud native. I didn't grow up in that world. I'm learning. Um, I'm asking questions. I get on Twitter. I get on Slack groups. I get on whatever. Go to training. I'm reading a Kubernetes book right now. I'm probably not going to finish reading it because I'm never going to actually use that. But I wanted to kind of understand a little more about what the words meant. So, you know, Mitch, going back to what has to change in education, mm -hmm. I think Rob just hit on something important, which is we do have to be prepared to just suck it up 
know the technology is changing faster than we can self, you know, teach ourselves most of these things and keep our day job. And we're going to have to get some help. We're going to have to raise our hand, ask some questions, not be embarrassed about that, go into training um, and, and ask questions there and not not feel like we're expected to know all of the answers all the time. It's okay to not know the answer. It's okay to just learn. I feel like security and cybersecurity and the medical industry share this phenomena. You can't say, I don't know. Your doctor's not supposed to say, I don't know. And neither is your cybersecurity architect. Let me, let me jump through a, a two, through a couple of things here just to share that. I'm going to want to wrap this up on a, on a topic here, you know, are budgets increasing. Yep. Absolutely. Not a surprising answer. I think that confirms if you need more money, show that slide to your boss. Um, you know, are you allocating more money to security? Yes, 28%. So again, show this one to your boss to get more money. Uh, we, how would you rate your overall team's, you know, uh, security readiness? Yeah, you know, we have a ways to go. Big middle again, kind of what we saw earlier. And on this training, um, you know, does your team need security, cloud security training and certification to be better equipped? Well, yes, absolutely. Makes sense that we would get that kind of an answer. Um, would employees benefit from training? I think those are things we probably knew already confirming that. Um, this is a question about different certifications, um, some of which come from uh, ISC squared, of course. And, um, you know, what kind of topics might be valuable, would be valuable um, for training. And that, that's what I want to end up on um, because some of the response were cloud enabled cybersecurity or incident response process in the cloud, frameworks for risk management, et cetera, application security. So to your, I want to go back to your point of, you know, we don't know what we don't know. I remember um, when I started working in on AWS, I didn't quite get it because it looked sort of like a dumbed down version of VMware in the early days of 2009 or so, eight or nine. You know, it was pretty basic, just kind of starting a server, loading stuff, storage, et cetera. And it wasn't until I went to the first reInvent um, conference and someone from Amazon, AWS, talked about how they changed, how the cloud changed, how they did rolling upgrades. There wasn't the spend all weekend Sunday night. Are we going to keep it in production? We're going to roll back. It was a rolling. I've got this capacity. I'm going to, I'm going to in parallel set up a whole group of systems that are running the upgraded piece of software, gradually point things over, do things in a, in a more of a dynamic rolling basis as opposed to all or nothing shot. And then I started, okay, I think I, that's, first example I've seen where I really kind of got it other than it's somebody else's computer. So when we think about cloud security, here's my question. I finally got to it to let you both end up on that in the next three minutes. And so that we end on time, let me also say that our, <laughs> gift, card, our gift card winners are, are Yanya G, um, uh, Dave B, Carlos M, and Eric P. So by the way, we'll get a hold of you about those gift cards. So um, Rob, give, give us a little bit about how do we need to look at certifications and training uh, differently through a different lens looking forward? Rapid ability to upgrade constantly. It's, you know, as soon as, you know, our struggle, and I think a lot of people struggle is that the interface changes on a weekly basis. You know, the APIs, the back end, there are things that we're trying to do, you know, it, it's, we need the erector set to build the erector set in order to, be, <laughs> if you think about it, we, we're trying to get a repeatable thing that's okay, we're gonna go set up a cloud in the cloud for a training aspect. You know, it's like, how do you set up that environment that's realistic, that's, you know, mirrors what you're experiencing in the real world? These are really hard challenges in order to provide the training and not just have a bunch of you know, hey, I'm going to lecture or read a book on it, that you're actually having the hands-on, that you're actually going and doing the thing. But once you get that hands-on doing the thing, you know, t trademark, that thing is updated next week. So you, the ability to rapidly update the material has become one of these key aspects of, you know, how, you know, the hardest part about this now is, you know, that's no longer a static thing that's going to last a couple of years the science behind it, the underneath, you know, uh, components are hard to keep up to date, rapid updates. 
Great. Continuous upgrades. <laughs> JJ. I'm going to keep us on time by going ditto, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and I'll add this, I'll add this one comment because I know Rob, you and I, and I think maybe with, with Mitch, we've talked about this before with, yeah, but all of those other things that are in here, like mobile security and IOT and everything down here, those things are changing as well. And so it's kind of like now this dual, you know, like running back and forth to keep the the balance, the, the scales balance between learning this new thing and learning this new thing and this new thing and this new thing. Um, so just, yeah, constant education now um, and have networks, you know, do training and have networks of people you can ask questions to. I, I ask way more questions than I answer. <laughs> Very good. Well, and I think this panel represents some of that sharing and learning from each other, as well as the need to to rapidly uh, adjust and change and kind of assume that we're going to need to continuously learn at a faster pace. So there's some great takeaways and they'll be in the slides again from when and you can we'll receive those as long as well as the recording link to the recording for everybody that uh, registered. So some key takeaways. You know, 96% or at least moderately concerned about public cloud security. Um, small increase from last year. So we're kind of where we were. You know, the barriers around adoption, qualified staff, and bringing up the need for more people with those skills. Um, talking about native cloud providers uh, tools and how those fit into the picture. Um, budgets increasing, their, their state of readiness. 73% um, had rated their team security readiness at a, a above average or average or below, sorry, excuse me. So we've got some work to do. Uh, so a lot of good findings in this report and I appreciate the folks at um, ISC Squared for sponsoring today's webinar and providing with the, uh, the data uh, that we're, we're reviewing. So we definitely want to take a, take a moment to thank uh, both JJ Manila uh, who's with us today, as well as Rob Lee, and sharing your expertise. Uh, just think of the years of experience that uh, collectively were on the panel today. Hopefully that's been some really good information and we all learned something from it too. So thank you for joining us today, everyone. Do want to remind folks out there that um, ISC Squared has their Security Congress 2021 uh, Global Virtual Conference, October 18th through the 20th. So be sure to check that out on their site as well. On behalf of the team at securityboulevard.com and our panel here today, thank you for joining us. And we hope that you're safe out there in the cloud and beyond. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.